fashionable it may appear, I am actually convinced that there really are good reasons to believe that God exists. And let me just sketch tonight briefly some of those reasons. There is zero evidence for the existence of God. On the other hand, I think we've got five good reasons, all of which point to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute value, who has revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth, and who can be personally known and experienced. My argument against God's existence doesn't depend upon genes. It's the absence of evidence. In fact, I would venture to say that Christianity as a worldview stands intellectually head and shoulders above any other ism or philosophy of life that you might care to enunciate. And for that reason, I find myself enthusiastically a Christian theist. Good morning, everyone. What? Too chirpy? Tone it down a little. Good level of chirpy? Okay, I'm trying to, I mean, like, yeah, trying to match you and Jackie and, you know, like, got to lift my game a little bit in the chirpiness department. Um, yes, so today is week three of our little reason series that we've been doing. And uh, apparently people take notes. Is that right? Do people actually take notes? Oh, I can see a couple of little notepads. That's cool. Yeah, that's fun. Great. Well, for those who have been taking notes, uh, you might know that the last couple of weeks, uh, yeah, we've been doing this reason series and we've been talking about whether or not it's reasonable to believe in God, whether or not an examination of the evidence that exists in our universe uh, leads us to reason that there is a God or not. And so far, uh, over the first two weeks, we've looked at two, what I would say, I think are quite strong arguments to show that belief in God is reasonable and is rational. For me personally, and I know that everyone will interpret the evidence differently. For me personally, I do find that the evidence, not just those two pieces, but the broader evidence as well, I find it pretty overwhelming uh, in favor of God's existence. And that, uh, as we've talked about over the past 150 years, there have really been some pretty major significant scientific discoveries that have pretty much, I would say, abolished any prospect that the universe could have purely naturalistic causes. And if you aren't, haven't been here, particularly last week or the week before, um, really would encourage you to follow up. Uh, we've had the services recorded. I don't think they're on YouTube yet. Shaz, whose job is that to upload them to YouTube? They went up yesterday, so they are on our YouTube. Excellent. Well done, team. So you can get good help, Chaz. <laughs> so they are on our YouTube. So you could go home right now. Would, you, would the QR code even leave, lead you to the website? And then it would lead you straight to the YouTube. Look at how effective Greenpoint is these days. Gosh, we're efficient. So I would really encourage you to go and check out those. But yeah, I guess the, um, the bottom line is that Really, at the end of the day, uh, the idea of a naturalistic universe, this is what we've been talking about in the first two weeks, uh, the idea that the universe just has simple naturalistic explanations, um, that prospect, that position has been all but abandoned by scientists, whether they're theistic, atheistic or agnostic, all have recognized now that we need to actually go beyond a natural explanation for the universe. Even, like I said, atheistic scientists have reached that same conclusion. And there have been a number of major scientific discoveries, which I believe spell real uh, mischief or trouble for anyone trying to contend a view that doesn't involve some sort of creator or some sort of God or something outside of space and time and the universe. And meanwhile, I can't think personally of one scientific discovery that causes any issues for theism or for the belief in God. I wish I had longer to recap. I don't want to spend too long recapping what we looked at in the first two weeks. Get on the YouTube um, if you did miss it because we've got too much to cover today. For me, the next logical question after that, after if we can establish that there is a God that the universe requires some sort of a creator to explain it, I guess the next logical question after that is if theism is correct, if it is true that there is a God or there are gods or some sort of 
outside the natural universe being, if there was a creator to this universe, if this world was created for some purpose, can we actually know that God? Can we actually know which of the proposed gods in the world is that one? You know, there are so many different religions in our world, different views on God. How could we possibly say with any kind of confidence that one in particular is right? I think that's sort of the next logical question. And really, if you read through the work of Richard Dawkins, who's maybe, maybe the world's most famous atheist or proponent of atheists these days, Richard Dawkins, probably his main argument is about exactly this, uh, that you know, if you were born in India, most likely you'd be a Hindu. If you were born in Iran, most likely you'd be a Muslim. It shouldn't really come as that much of a shock for those of us who were born in a Christian nation. If we find ourselves Christian, that's not, that shouldn't be particularly surprising. And as Dawkins would contend, ultimately, the case for Yahweh is no more plausible than the case for Allah or for Brahman or for Zeus or for the flying spaghetti monster. And to believe anything else, to believe that your religion is special and yes, you're, the thing that you were raised in, that's the right one. To, to believe something like that is just kind of arrogance or ignorance. That would be the contention of Dawkins. So today we're gonna to be asking the question, why Christianity? Is it actually any different? Does it have any right to sort of claim some sort of monopoly on truth? And as we talk about reason and evidence and making a case for a particular belief, the last couple of weeks, we've done only one argument each week and we've kind of zoomed in a little bit and that's within a spectrum of lots of arguments. We, we sort of just took the time to focus on two. Today, I'd like to encourage you to consider that in some cases, like if you think of a legal case or a criminal case, you know, when we talk about evidence, sometimes the word evidence doesn't necessarily mean some kind of indisputable, absolutely conclusive proof of something, does it? Sometimes evidence doesn't necessarily mean that it's case closed. Often, uh, in different sorts of cases, it's a matter of considering lots of pieces of evidence and seeing what makes the most sense of the cumulative weight of the evidence that we have. It's not always as simple as having the smoking gun or the DNA on the scene. Uh, sometimes you have to look at all the available evidence and ask the question, what is most likely, what is most reasonable out of what we have to work with? And so today we're not gonna just focus on one, we're actually gonna look at a few of the key reasons why you might consider Christianity different um, to other forms of theism. Theism, sorry, is just the belief in God. So other forms of theism, other beliefs in God um, or other religions. And we're gonna cover a lot of ground. Each of these different pieces of evidence could easily be expanded upon for a full message. Some of them I've preached or I've, other people have preached full messages on each of these ones individually. Each one in itself could be a full meal, but instead we're just gonna have a little bite of each one. We're gonna kind of do like tappers, you know, Sunday morning tappers, have a little bit of each meal rather than necessarily go full and devour the entire dish. Uh, and it probably means there might be some follow-up questions because we're gonna like move kind of quickly through it. And it's a good thing, therefore, that if you do have follow-up questions, we've got our Q&A happening afterwards, if you like, or I'm always happy to have a chat at any point. I'm sure others are too. Here we go, launching in. Reason number one for what makes Chris, the Christian God a likely candidate amongst a list of possible suspects. I'm calling reason number one the trajectory of history. So in that little intro clip that we watched where you hear the guys debating, one of the fellows, William Lane Craig, the sort of Christian philosopher that's arguing there, uh, he makes the case that if God is knowable, if there is a God and he is knowable and he wants to interact with humankind, you'd expect that to somehow be reflected in humanity's history, wouldn't you? That perhaps history might kind of highlight that religion, or at least that it might be one of several religions that have been highlighted or seem most likely through history. Um, I remember when I was at Bible college, we got sent out at like on these little mission trips um, just to go and visit regional churches, just to partner with regional churches. And we got sent on a trip up to Nimbin, which was pretty fun. Um, and I don't know if you know anything about Nimbin. Uh, 
there's a very high level of new age spirituality up there, which is cool. There's also some very high levels of other things up in Nimbin, <laughs> but creative types. No, like creative types are great. That's not a slur. Anyway, anyway, me and my friend were going to a market and uh, we were just sort of checking out what's happening in Nimbin, check out the local Nimbin culture. And we went up to the market and we saw this store that was set up with a lady that was selling lots of crystals and some wands and all sorts of like new age paraphernalia. And we just went up to it and we weren't there to, you know, like, um, yeah, we weren't there to interfere with Nimbin life. We were just there to learn and to discuss and yeah, figure out what Nimbin's all about. And, you know, we're standing there and we're talking about the crystals and stuff and the wands and stuff that she's selling and asking her, you know, like, yeah, what the story is. And she was telling us about all the different sort of power that's involved and where it all comes from is that there's these spiritual dragons that are linked to the crystals and the spiritual dragons are flying all around us, but only some people have the gift of being able to see the spiritual dragons. But each of us has spiritual dragons that have attached themselves to us and give us different powers. And she had the power from a dragon that she could look into the eyes of other people and see the divine being within them. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, me and my friend, we asked her just in a polite way, not in an offensive way, how did you form this kind of belief? Like, where, where does this come from, this um, yeah, idea about the dragons and stuff? And she thought about it for a little bit and said, I'm not really sure, but I remember being on a plane once and I think I just kind of realized all of it. And it was like, Cool, awesome, yeah, long flight, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess what I'm thinking and, and I guess what maybe William Lane Craig is sort of alluding to in, in his point uh, with this trajectory of human history thing is that if there is a God or if there are gods and they want to be known by us, they want to have relationships with humans, it seems unlikely to me that of all the different beliefs that exist in the world, if God is trying to have a relationship with humanity, that he would have just revealed himself to this one woman in her particular unique way on the plane um, in that moment. Like that might be wrong, but it seems to me unlikely. Generally, you would think that if God wanted to be known and wanted to have followers, there would be a certain level of success for God in that. And I guess when you look at history and you look at yeah, maybe what religions or what groups might actually be highlighted to say that maybe they have had God's involvement in the development of that belief system. I would say that when you look at the history of the people of Israel, which of course is where Christianity originally comes from, obviously they themselves have very ancient beliefs, ancient beliefs going back as far as human history records. And by the time of Jesus, the people of Israel have survived a very long period where of significant um, occupations and, and serious military losses, um, plenty of opportunities where they came pretty close to being wiped out but weren't. And they suffered under occupations under nations such as the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, all different nations that came and sort of took control of them for a while. But through all of that, through all of that history as a nation and as a people and as a faith, through all of that, not only did their bloodlines and their national identity survive, but their culture and their faith remained strong through all of it. I think there's something to that. And of course, you talk about a historical trajectory. Um, after Jesus, the trajectory of the Christian faith went from being, depending on how you draw the numbers, maybe a few hundred disciples um, from when Jesus uh, was wandering around and, and chatting to disciples. It went from that to being the largest movement in all of human history. Uh, I think you can see a little bit of a chart there, which is from a book by William Lane Craig. The data's a little bit old now, um, but the trajectory has not stopped um, in the same direction. 
that's a little chart of how many non-Christians per Christian there are in the world throughout history. I think it's something like in 100 AD, for every Christian in the world, there are 360 non-Christians. By 1000 AD, for every Christian in the world, there are 220 non-Christians. And the number continues to go down. 1989, for every Christian in the world, seven non-Christians. Today, Christianity is the largest religion in the world and it and Islam are the two fastest growing religions in the world. Which religion is growing faster depends on how you calculate it, either by raw numbers or as by percentage. But interestingly, of those two rapidly growing religions, I guess looking at a bit of a comparison between them, most of the growth in Islam is actually happening due to high birth rates. Uh, that I think there's a graph there as well. Hopefully my head's not in the way of it. Uh, you can see a bit of a graph there as well, data from 2010 to 2015, that during that time, Muslims represented 24% of the world's population. During that time, only 21% of the world's death uh, were deaths were Muslim people. But a massive 31% of the world's births were Muslims. People from Islamic nations, the people of the Islamic faith, are having children at a much faster rate. Um, than other faiths. Uh, and not only that, not only are they sort of reproducing pretty quickly, um, but, and, and most of the growth sort of being through having children, there is of course something to say on the other side of it, which is that not many people actually leave the Islamic faith. And there might be a couple of different reasons for that, but certainly at least part of it is that in most Islamic nations, you're actually not allowed to leave the faith. It's actually either illegal or at least highly dangerous to leave the faith. Uh, many, yeah, not, not to mention necessarily like family shame and other things that are involved as well. So not many people who are born into Islam leave and most of the growth is, ha growth is happening through having lots of children. Whereas the growth in Christianity is not like that at all. And you can see on the other side that the growth in Christianity is not happening just through having lots of children. Uh, in fact, if it was just reliant on that, then the numbers of Christians would be going down um, faster. We're overrepresented in the number of people who have died and underrepresented in uh, births. The, the growth in Christianity uh, is mostly happening actually because of conversions. People who did not grow up in a Christian culture, people who did not grow up in a Christian family, who are actually changing their mind, changing their opinion, actually becoming Christians, coming to the faith. All of that to say, perhaps you could say that what's happening in our world, what's been happening in our world throughout history, if, if God is actually at work in human history and has a role in it, there's at least some sort of case to be made that Christianity and maybe a couple of others would be sort of the prime suspects rather than, you know, some individual spirituality or, or understanding of the universe. It, it, that would maybe just seem a little less likely. But... Moving into a different piece of evidence, like I said, sort of moving on to different things. Uh, one thing which I think is really important and really quite unique about Christianity is the question of where it comes from, the unique origins of Christianity. Almost all other major religions and their holy books, their scriptures, originate from a particular religious leader having a private spiritual moment and recording their teachings. So again, just to look firstly at Islam, the Quran is supposedly, the teachings of the Quran is supposedly all of the teachings that an angel or the information that an angel passed on to Muhammad in secret meetings. No one else was there able to witness that or hear that. And Muhammad had this spiritual knowledge that was passed on to him that he had written down by scribes. And that is the basis, the entire Islamic faith is based on one person's private spiritual moment that they had. But that's not just a, th a thing at all unique to Islam. Buddhism tells the story of a prince who, you might know the story of Buddhism. The Buddha goes on a journey around his kingdom uh, with different little stages, different little interactions with people around the kingdom that each teach him something, some spiritual truth about the universe. And through that process, he reaches spiritual enlightenment and he has people write down all of these different thoughts and different spiritual wisdom and understanding, and that's the basis. And so we sort of 
take on his enlightenment and his teaching from that private epiphany that he had. Mormonism's scripture is the private spiritual moment of Joseph Smith. Hinduism's Vedas, another very ancient um, text, but it is the spiritual revelation of meditating sages that, again, understood all these spiritual principles of the universe and wrote them down. Scientology is a supposed private revelation. And of course, as we established, the belief in dragon spirit powers was a private revelation for a lady on a plane from Nimbin. The Bible, on the other hand, is shockingly different. It is not just one person who believes they've had a private spiritual epiphany and just asks you to take their word for it. The Bible is very different. It's a collection. It's not one book even. It's a collection of 66 different books and letters written over a span of a thousand years by 39 different authors in different languages in different countries. And the overwhelming majority of what's written in it, there is some stuff which is, you know, visions or interactions with spiritual stuff, but overwhelming majority of it is not personal, private moments most of it is just recounts or even letters or historical records most of it is just people writing down the things that they saw the things that they did often quite uh embarrassing like not necessarily just all like uh very flattering for the people who are writing it and they're writing it down as they're not writing it down for us for the most part they're writing it down as letters or as recounts for other people in their time so, for example, have a look at the start of the book of Luke. He's not writing to us. He's writing to a guy named Theophilus, is what it says at the start of the book of Luke. Many people have tried to tell the story of what God has done among us. They wrote what we had been told by the ones who were there in the beginning. He's talking about the disciples, the eyewitnesses, and saw what happened. So I made a careful study of everything and then decided to write and tell you exactly what took place. Honorable Theophilus, I have done this to let you know the truth about what you have heard. He's just writing to a letter. He's saying, I've investigated all the things. I've taken the reports and I've tried my best to write an account so you would know the truth of what happened regarding Jesus. And, you know, when you open up to the New Testament, you read through different stories. It, it reads, I think, very differently to a lot of other, you know, religious texts. You flip it open and you just end up on some story about, a bunch of guys in some specific town down by the lake cooking breakfast and then you know Jesus starts walking over to them and they're all freaking out and going oh my goodness and Jesus says it's okay relax and like it's just sort of weird normal stuff it's just them telling basically the story of what they experience it's not about some private spiritual moment that's impossible to verify that there's no one else around for it's talking a lot of the time in fact about very public events and it's about eyewitness accounts written to other people living at the same time that could have either shown that those things were true or not very easy to show whether or not all of the things that the new testament says are false uh, there's so much that we can compare in the gospels to other historical documents of the same time to assess whether or not they're actually accurate documents and it's written by eyewitnesses who not only sort of say that they saw these things but believed themselves so strongly that when it became illegal for them to be christians for them to go and share the christian faith with other people over decades they're sort of systematically hunted and executed um, as other historical sources tell us about how they were all killed but they were all so certain of the things that they're talking about and that they saw and that they were part of that they were so changed by them, they kept sharing the good news regardless, um, even many of them still sharing the gospel at their own executions. So for me, it's a critical question, this sort of second piece of evidence. Where did the religion come from? If it's just one guy sitting in a cave having some spiritual epiphany and asking me to base my whole worldview on that, I'm a bit hesitant. If it's dozens of different people reporting their common experiences, that they were all very clearly convinced that they were true, that's something quite unique. Strongly connected to our third reason, the historicity of the New Testament. I think I've probably shared this story before with some people that I used to work in a bookstore down in Sydney 
And then each week there was a man who'd come into the bookstore and he'd go to the history section and he'd take out all the copies of the New Testament from the history section and he'd go over to fiction and he'd put them on the shelf in the fiction section. And, he, and every week he would come back in and do it and we would move it back. And every week he would just come and move it back. And it was kind of a fun little game, I suppose. But obviously he was from the perspective that it's ridiculous to consider the New Testament, a holy book, a scripture that talks about things like resurrections and miracles, to put that in a history section. So does the New Testament have a place amongst historical texts? Well, the reality is that when it comes to ancient documents, the New Testament absolutely, there's no argument about it, eclipses every other ancient text by pretty much any metric that an ancient historian will measure by. Let me, let me show that to you. I'm sure many people will have heard of Alexander the Great. Have people heard of Alexander the Great? Greek dude or what, what are they actually called? Me, Mas, Macedonians? Yeah, Macedonians. Not Greek, but sort of the Greek Empire, right? It's, it's all the same thing. Anyway, Alexander the Great, giant of ancient history, someone who we know today quite a lot about. We know about his conquests, we know about his campaigns, we know about his personal life, we know about some very specific things that he said, that he did, lots of different things that we know and believe about Alexander the Great. And we know it all through a few different sources, sources like Plutarch and Arian, Rufus and Siculus and others. And all of those sources, if you think about like a timeline, all of those sources were written around the late first, early second century. So about, about 100 years after Jesus, right? That's when all those sources write about Alexander the Great. Do you know when Alexander the Great lived? It wasn't 100 years after Jesus. It was about 450 years before that in the fourth century BC. But almost everything we know about him wasn't written down for about five centuries. So these guys writing, the, the, the man historians who wrote about him, obviously they never met Alexander. They lived almost 500 years apart. But what these guys go up was different oral tradition that had been passed to them, oral tradition that had served four or five hundred years. The New Testament was written there during these events, either as eyewitnesses or people who interacted and travelled and were companions of the eyewitnesses, of, of the disciples. And the texts themselves that we have in the New Testament were circulated during the same generation of people who had lived through it, who themselves could go and investigate and verify the reports or falsify the reports. And how we know that, how we know that uh, this was when it was all happening and that these were really the people, is that first of all, we have internal evidence within the text themselves, where it just sort of makes it pretty clear from the text who is writing it. That's just something that's important that exists. It doesn't necessarily conclusively prove it just because it claims to be uh, one of the disciples writing it. But we also have secondary evidence in other ancient historians, guys like Irenaeus and Papias, who confirm the gospel writers, who confirm that it is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, who confirm who those guys actually are and that they wrote their gospels. We're also able to date the texts and to know that they were circulating during the lifetime of these events, again affirming that it was Jesus' disciples or the people who travelled as companions that were the people who wrote those books. I think a lot of people, if you ask a lot of people just out in the world, uh, I think a lot of people would say that Jesus was just some white teacher, but any stories about him coming back from the dead or performing miracles, like he was probably a really good dude and had a great following, but ideas about miracles and from the dead, like that probably was like legends that crept in over time. You know, like every generation as they told the story, just like it got a little bit more exciting every time and they threw in something a little bit more insane every time. But all the historical evidence shows that that's not a possibility. There was no time for such legends or myths to creep in. 
the, all the historical evidence shows that the very first Christians taught the resurrection of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, and that these things didn't change over time. Obviously, we don't have the original documents. We don't have you know, the original letters that Paul, like the actual pieces of paper that he wrote on. We don't have the original ones that Mark or Luke had people writing on. What we have are copies or manuscripts, like every ancient text. We don't have the originals for any of them. But there are measurements we use to assess how accurate those copies are. Measurements that we use in history to assess how accurate those manuscripts are. Let's have a quick look at some other examples of well-known ancient texts. Julius Caesar, another name that I'm sure most people have heard of. Julius Caesar, there's an autobiography of Julius Caesar, uh, which is originally written, and I think there might be a little bit of a graph there, yeah. Originally written somewhere between 144 BC, the earliest manuscript, the earliest copy that we have of that writing is from 900 AD, which is a thousand years after he actually wrote it. The earliest copy that we have is from a thousand years later. So obviously there's been lots of copies made and passed around in between then, but we don't have any of those. We've got one from a thousand years later. And we've got 10 of those early manuscripts from that sort of period of time, which is the earliest that we have, we've got 10 manuscripts. So, so we don't really know whether that through that copying it changed or things were introduced or whatever, we're not really sure. The consistency of copies, when there's only 10, you don't really measure the consistency. Thucydides would be one of my favorites. Uh, it talks about, you know, like the Peloponnesian War, Sparta and Athens and stuff like that. And originally written 460 to 400 BC, the earliest manuscript, again, that we have of that is from about 900 AD. That's a time gap of 1300 years between when it was actually written and our earliest copy. And the number of manuscripts we have for that is eight. So again, we don't even measure the consistency of the copies. Now there's a very, you sort of, if you were to like make a ranking list, I mean, these, these and Thucydides, these, these are giants of antiquity. Like these, these are, if, if you go to the history section in that bookstore that I worked in, like we've got copies of those for sure. Those are not just random obscure little books. But, in, in terms of going down the list, the number two of all time in terms of transmission and accuracy of manus manuscripts and reliability of manuscripts is the Iliad by Homer. It talks about you know, the Trojan War. Uh, originally written in 900 BC, the earliest manuscript that we have is from 400 BC. Pretty impressive, time gap of 500 years. We've got 643 manuscripts, which is pretty impressive. And the consistency when you compare all those different manuscripts, the consistency, how much they have in common, 95%. So there's some little errors in copying and at some point it's diverged in different directions. But 95% of it is identical across all those copies. But the number one text from ancient times by a long margin is the New Testament. The New Testament, and obviously the New Testament is made up of lots of different letters and writings, like we said. So the dates that it was written are between 50 and 100 AD. And the earliest manuscripts that we have are from 130 AD. So depending on kind of, yeah, different parts of it, about 50 year time gap. The number of manuscripts that we have are 6,500. And I believe off the top of my head that 5,000 of those are in Greek and 1,500 of those are, have been translated into different languages. And they're not all just in the one place, they're actually spread through the world. So it's obviously taken some time for them to have been written and spread. Consistency across those huge number of manuscripts is 99.5%. In terms of trying to assess whether the manuscripts that we have are an accurate copy of what was originally written, this is ridiculous <laughs> like, like any other historical document looks like a joke in comparison to the new testament in terms of the historical reliability of transmission the new testament is in league entirely of its own when compared to any ancient text ever so we can be supremely confident that what we have are the words written by the first disciples in the early church and contrary to many people's assumptions the new testament documents themselves are not the only historical information that we have on Jesus, even if you were to get rid of the Bible entirely, despite it being the number one historical document of all time, ancient historical document of all time, even if you said, well, you know, it's biased, let's just get rid of it, we can still learn a lot about Jesus. And I think there's a list there, we won't go through it. 
There's a list there just of non-Christian sources of what they had to say about Jesus. It's not just uh, the eyewitnesses who talk about it. It's other historians from the same time. And all of these, the one thing they all have in common is that none of them are Christians. Uh, they're all potentially, yet. Yeah, I mean, the Jews and the Romans did not like Christians. They were the ones trying to get rid of Christians. Uh, yeah, so these are all non-Christian sources and they all give plenty of information and, pl and paint a pretty clear picture still of who Jesus is uh, and, and give us many different ways, um, yeah, of knowing more about Jesus. That, that was the long reason. We, we, none of the others will take that long. The fourth reason uh, is prophecy. And geez, you could easily spend a whole message looking at prophecy. But the facts are that we have scrolls of Old Testament prophecies dating back many centuries before Jesus was born that tell us all sorts of information about uh, this person who's to come, this Messiah who's to come, what people are expecting, what the Jews were expecting. Uh, they give us lots of information that's very specific um, and you can see is very clearly fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Information about particular moments in his life, his birthplace, his family bloodline, the manner of his death, the details of his resurrection, so much more. About 500 different prophecies that Jesus fulfills, many of them written, yeah, 600, 800 years before him, some even older than that. And some some are pretty, even from skeptics, someone will read, for example, Isaiah 53 uh, that talks about the Messiah, the suffering servant, the one who will be pierced for the sins of the world, take away the sins of the world through his own death. You ask any historian, whether they're a Christian or not, who in all of history does this make you think of? Who, who do you think this would be talking about? People say, well, Jesus. A fifth reason, moving on, is what I would call maybe resonance. And I guess having different conversations with people, for some people, I think this is, this is one of the biggest reasons, is just actually that the teachings of Christianity are quite unique in a lot of ways. And sometimes even just the teachings of Christianity can resonate with us and, and make more sense to us than maybe some of the teachings of other religions. If you ask the question, what, what is actually quite, what is different in the teachings or the faith of Christians, what's different in the message of it? I think a lot of people would say, and certainly C.S. Lewis said, uh, that what makes Christianity pretty unique is that every other religion, you are earning your salvation. That's the whole point of the religion. You're following a guidebook, a bunch of religious rules to uh, earn your salvation, to pay off your sort of spiritual debt or whatever it is, uh, that you know, if you can build up enough good karma or demonstrate enough religious devotion, uh, then you, know, you will have found your way to whatever it is that your soul wants to go uh, next. Whereas the message of Christianity is uniquely a message of grace and of forgiveness and of second chances. The message of Christianity is that you don't have to earn it. You don't have to earn a relationship with God or forgiveness or salvation. You don't have to try and balance the scales. It pictures God, Christianity does, not as an angry judge who at the end of your life will weigh your good against your bad or who expects yeah, you to have some spiritual debt that you have to pay him off to cover for. The image that Jesus actually gives to us is the image of a father who just loves his children and desperately wants to be in relationship with them no matter what. It's a pretty different sort of teaching. It's not really about religion, it's about relationship. And I think for a lot of people that fifth reason that it resonates with them, it, it can be an important one. The sixth and final reason that we're going to look at is the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection really is the centerpiece of the Christian faith. A good summary of the resurrection of Jesus is found in Paul's letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15. Um, and Paul, by the way, you know, was a non-believer. In fact, he was a leader of the movement to have the Christians exterminated, to have the Christian faith shut down. You know, like in his mind, it was not true and he wanted it gone. And he was part of a, you know, the crew of zealot Jews who were going around arresting, executing Christians until he himself met Jesus after the resurrection and changed his mind radically, had a big, obviously, oh my gosh, I've been wrong and had a big moment of change in his life. And so this statement in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, this, there's, there's consensus on this, that 
this particular statement is important because it dates within a few years of Jesus' death. This isn't even something that was written 50 years later or 40 years later or 10 years later. This is within a few years of Jesus' death. Uh, and the global church has sort of yeah, started growing, started expanding out. And this is sort of a bit of a statement of faith that uh, Paul has received and is passing on to other people. This is what it says. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Again, this is a message that's circulating widely within a few years of Jesus' death. They're going around saying there are over 500 witnesses to the resurrected Jesus. If you want, you can go and talk to them. These people are still alive. And Paul and James, like I said, who were both non-Christians during Jesus' life and even after Jesus' death, become believers and leaders of the church because they meet with Jesus after his resurrection. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and, and we have done messages before, the historical evidence for the resurrection. We're not going to do that because that's a whole talk in itself, and we're getting towards the end. But there is very compelling evidence to establish the resurrection of Jesus as a historical event and very good reasons to dismiss alternate explanations of those historical facts, to dismiss theories such as the theory that the disciples stole the body and that they sort of had this conspiracy going where they were trying to get people to believe he'd come back, but actually they just stole the body. Uh, or that they had that they really believed he was back, that they sort of shared a mass hallucination about it all or something a bit kooky happened there where they, yeah, thought they'd experienced Jesus back from the dead. Uh, or that he hadn't really died, that he'd just sort of passed out on the cross and then they put him in the tomb and he didn't really like resurrect, he just kind of resuscitated. Very good historical reasons to dismiss these possible alternatives and alternate theories. And uh, fourthly, uh, the, the idea, like we sort of talked about, that it was just a legend or a myth that crept in over time. There's very good reason to dismiss that as a possibility as well. Uh, in 2003, there was a debate at a California university, and the title of the debate was, Did the Resurrection of Jesus Really Happen? And it was a debate between a guy, uh, Gary Habermas, uh, who was a Christian theologian, arguing obviously in favor that yes, the resurrection did happen. And a guy called Anthony Flew, a very significant British philosopher and often referred to as the father of new atheism. He was really one of the first who, like he wrote uh, the atheistic parables and he, he, yeah, his work has circulated quite widely. He's sort of thought to be the person who gave birth to that movement of new atheism that Richard Dawkins and Chris Hitchens and Sam Harris and others have like followed in Anthony Flew's footsteps. And potentially, like we've talked the last couple of weeks about this Western mindset that views religion as kind of ridiculous and nonsensical and unscientific um, and unreasonable. Uh, potentially Anthony Flew was one of the key catalysts in actually shaping that as kind of the Western mindset. And so at this debate that they're, they're, they're debating uh, the historicity of the resurrection, whether or not it really happened. And Anthony Flew, he's hearing most of the arguments that are being made historically for the resurrection. And he's kind of conceding most points. You can go and you can listen to the debate yourself if you like. He's kind of conceding on most points that he can't really account for the evidence that's being brought. seems to me so wildly inconsistent with everything else that happens in the universe. So for Anthony Flew, it's not that there was a lack of evidence for it historically, or that he disagreed with the evidence for it. It's that he couldn't possibly believe it because it couldn't possibly be true. And so therefore, no evidence was going to convince him that it was true. <coughs> in other words, 
The only reason, this is sort of my take on it, the only reason to believe that the resurrection is false is not because there's insufficient evidence to support it or that there's any evidence to the contrary, but simply because you're already committed to the idea that it's not even possible. So that debate was in 2003. Four years later, in 2007, Anthony Flew published a new book. And the title of the book was, There Is a God. <laughs> and he was angry at his publishers because his publishers added a little um, subtitle, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. There is a God. And in his book, Anthony talks about how during the decades that he's been arguing for atheism, he'd been going at it for quite a while by then, that as new arguments and more scientific discoveries were constantly being made, eventually the weight of the arguments that he was actually trying to fight against, he actually just had a realization that he was on the wrong side of the discussion. He, he felt like the continual scientific discoveries had actually forced him to change his mind, to concede that for decades he'd been wrong. That the only logical conclusion he could draw is that there is indeed a creator of the universe. And at the time that he published that book, he wasn't quite yet ready to commit to any particular form of theism or any particular religion. Uh, he needed more time to investigate and sadly he passed away actually a couple of years later in 2010. Who knows what was going on in his mind uh, during those years. But at the back of that book that he said, that he released in 2007, he, he said, I'm not a Christian yet. <laughs> but at the back of his book, he actually included an appendix. If, if you get the book, you'll find in the back of it an appendix, which is an essay arguing for the case of the resurrection of Jesus. And in Flew's own words, this is what he said. He said he believed that the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles in any other religion. It's outstandingly different in quality and quantity. This is a guy who's not coming from a Christian perspective, but he's saying that there is something here, there's something quite different, quite unique. So to summarize the, the pieces of evidence, I think, that I've mentioned today, and there'd be plenty of others, I'm sure. The trajectory of history, the unique origins of Christianity, it's not some private moment, it's public events, the historicity of the New Testament, the fulfillment of genuine prophecy, the philosophical resonance and you know, the unique teachings of Christianity and the evidence for the resurrection. These are just six reasons, I think, to believe that there is something actually quite special about Christianity. That, again, that intro clip that we listened to, William Lane Craig puts it this way. He says, I would venture to say that Christianity as a worldview stands intellectually head and shoulders above any other ism or philosophy that you might care to enunciate. And for that reason, I find myself enthusiastically a Christian theist. That's how I feel. I don't know. I think there's something pretty special about Christianity. I know that it's uh, potentially um, maybe arrogant to think that way, but I think actually God has given us and our God has given us some pretty strong reasons um, and some pretty clear ways that he has revealed himself to us. I'm going to pray to wrap it up and maybe the team can um, come up while I do that. Let, let's bow our heads. God, we thank you again for this opportunity that we've had um, over the last few weeks and next week as well to come together to question the message that we hear so often, uh, which is that, yeah, it's just kind of wishful thinking or false hope or blind faith. Lord, we thank you that when we actually really explore it, there are some very good reasons to believe in you. Lord, we thank you that the hope that you promise us is not just something that we wish for desperately, but that we can have a certainty and a, and a firm foundation for that hope. God, I pray that that would give us encouragement, that that would give us strength, that it wouldn't be just some intellectual exercise, Lord, but that 
yeah, in, in hard moments and in tough days, that we would be able to draw on that solid foundation, that we would be able to draw on that hope that we have in you. Lord, we know that at the end of the day, it's not about information and it's not about arguments. Uh, it's about a relationship. We know that that's what you want for us. Um, but Lord, in a world where people are so often hearing um, noise and, and just things against you, God, I pray that you would help us to be engaging into that, uh, to yeah, be helping other people to see uh, that you really are who you say you are and that we really can trust in the promises that you make for us. God, I pray, yeah, that you would uh, continue to be with us through the rest of today. Thank you that we can come together as a church family to encourage each other. And Lord, for whatever other thoughts and questions and wrestles we might be going through, God, I pray that we wouldn't shy away or hide them in a corner, um, but that we'd continue to engage and, uh, yeah, really get to know you better as well. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We finish just with a benediction um, from the end of that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writing some encouragement to fellow believers. He says, talking about the resurrection, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Have a great week.